What is up guys? Wrestling Premiere is here. Okay, I know I owed you guys this one for a while. Honestly, I've considered it for several months now, but in order to balance the content, I saved it for a while. I gotta get a mixture of new generation stuff, attitude era, I even tried some WCW stuff here and there. I will dive into TNA soon. I'm just trying to balance the content. The month of October is very versatile in terms of videos. In my eyes, it is the most versatile for me. I did a lot of lower card stuff, mid card, whatever. I just like diversifying the content. One thing I haven't done yet is mid card title reigns. I know there's Shelton Benjamin's first one, which might be a video in the coming weeks. There's RVD's ECW World Television title reign. There's not that many mid card title reigns that were special in these promotions. Anyways, with that said, this is the longest video on the channel so far. It has to be, right? Honestly, I didn't expect it to be this long. I thought it was going to be 15 minutes, but boy, was I wrong. I was completely wrong, and I knew it right from the beginning. Okay, Eminem, Candy. Marshall Mathers, nope, wrong one. Eminem, Mercury, Nitro, and Molina. Personal memories, yes, I kind of do remember them. They were essentially Hollywood snobs that wrestle. I used to do the weird title thing that they used to do, you know, it's dangling from their pants. I used to do it with one of those foam title belts. Weird memory. I personally love their gimmick, and it's a shame that they never progressed further than they did as a team. There was definitely a lot left in the tank, and upon their second run, the team were just there to feud with the Hardys. One thing that did cause the team to go their separate ways was Joey Mercury, his issues, his personal demons, you know how he had to go to rehab, he was released and all that stuff. And yeah, like if it wasn't for that, maybe they would have continued to be a tag team. With that said, how did Eminem form? Joey Mercury in 2004 was already a seasoned vet, as funny as it may sound. He was 25 and under his belt was loads of experience. He debuted in 1996 as Joey Matthews and wrestled in Omega, which is the Hardys' promotion. He signed with WCW and despite not wrestling, he could have learned something there. His big break of sorts came when he signed with ECW. Along with Christian York, the duo were known as the Bad Street Boys. Along with Shannon Moore and Gregory Helms. The latter weren't in ECW, they were signed to WCW. And one thing to note about Matthews and York is that the WWF actually suggested they go to ECW, you know, to develop a little and then come back and sign with them. That's why they went. But before they could do much in ECW, the company closed in March of 2001 and they were back on the indie circuit. Mercury managed to compete in a couple of promotions including TNA's X Division, Dark Matches on Heat and Velocity, Ring of Honor, 3PW, but soon though, WWE signed him to a developmental deal and sent him down to Ohio Valley Wrestling. It was there where he met Johnny Nitro. As for how he got to OVW, he initially applied for Tough Enough. He was already a lifelong fan, but to Kevin Dunn, he was just patronizing wrestling in his eyes. He wants to flip, act, run. Okay, basically I want to be a soccer player. I want to run, defend, score goals. Doesn't make sense to me. He wants to do what they do, but he doesn't want to be a wrestler. I don't get that. The departments, but not in pro wrestling. John Hennigan once again applied for Tough Enough the following year, and this time around, he actually won the whole thing. The funny part in this is the fact that Kevin Dunn himself said he didn't see much in the guy. Nitro was sent to developmental, and shortly afterwards, he debuted on the roster as John Hennigan, his real name. After a couple of weeks, he was Johnny Blaze, and eventually, Johnny Nitro, which was paying homage to Eric Bischoff as the Raw GM, employed him as an apprentice, which derived from Donald Trump's show. He even had the WCW Nitro song as his entrance music. This run lasted for about three or four months before Hennigan found himself back in OVW. This was where he formed Eminem with Mercury and Melina. Now whenever I see this Ruthless Aggression stars in OVW, it feels like a completely different realm. The gimmick initially felt different in my eyes, it seemed like they were flamboyant guys, but over time they became Hollywood elitists. Melina was initially brought in by Matt Capotelli as Nitro's ex-girlfriend, but she realigned herself with him and they partnered with Mercury to become M and M. They used to come out to Superstar by Saliva, which got a laugh out of me, and the fur coats were probably straight from Vin Diesel's closet. Another thing to note is that Joey still went by the last name of Matthews. Down there, they captured the OVW Southern Tag Team Championships on one occasion, and once they got everything down, the WWE called them up from OVW in April of 2005. At this point, the SmackDown Tag Team division was really lacking. Sure, there was Eddie and Ray, the Bashams, but other than that, there was only Charlie Haas and whoever he teams up with, be it Rico, Shelton Benjamin, or during this time period, Hardcore Holly. On the April 14th, 2005 episode of SmackDown, Eminem crashed the Carlitos Cabana. There was red carpet, fur coats, paparazzi, everything was there. Taz was very impressed, but he didn't know who these three were. Obviously, when Melina did the splits, he went nuts. Carlito, too, he was mesmerized. He called them cool, which is essentially a great compliment, and they introduced themselves as Eminem. Melina arrogantly claimed that her boys can easily snatch those tag team titles away, and Ray insulted her before Eminem attacked. 
Mysterio tried defending himself but was unsuccessful. The fans were anticipating Eddie Guerrero but he was nowhere to be found. The new duo hit the snapshot and Carlito was shook. In an effort to get a title shot, Eminem once again asked the following week. Eddie, however, wanted them to make the challenge face-to-face, -face, and they instead preferred to stay there, next to his lowrider. The trio spray-painted the ride, and Eddie frantically ran to the back. This was enough for Latino Heat to accept the challenge, and there was already issues between Ray and Eddie. So this was a way to let out all that frustration on two opponents. So the match was on, Eminem versus Eddie and Ray for the titles inside Madison Square Garden. Ray especially had a lot of fire in him. Eminem showcased their skills for the world to see, and it seemed like Ray and Eddie had it figured out. But then Molina outsmarted Guerrero and in the ring Eminem hit snapshot to capture their first WWE Tag Team Championships in their very first match on the main roster. The tensions were starting to reach a boiling point between the former champs and the rematch the following week was supposed to be a remedy of sorts. But this time around Eddie walked out on his partner leaving him alone in the ring. The fans were chanting Eddie, Eddie and he had second thoughts. So he's back. But a couple of minutes later, he didn't feel like entering the match. Eminem hit snapshot, and so Eddie and Ray lost their opportunity. Scratch that, Ray lost his opportunity. They disrespected Ray, and Eddie didn't even do a single thing. Seeing as Ray and Eddie were moving elsewhere, Eminem did the same. And if you want their story, check out this video. With that said, Eminem's next challengers for the titles were Hardcore Holly and Charlie Haas. They were set to face off at Judgment Day, but three nights before the event, Joey Mercury faced Hardcore Holly in a preview match. Mercury found himself on the receiving end of the Alabama Slamma, and he lost. Now, the match at Judgment Day was, by all accounts, good. Melina called it the biggest night in pay-per-view history, praised the hell out of her boys, and she got the crowd to boo, obviously. You know, the hottest team on the scene. With that said, Eminem took control during the match. They isolated Hardcore in the corner, and at one point, Charlie got tagged in, but since the ref didn't see it, things went back to the way they were. As for Eminem, they were tagging in and out. It was a simple strategy that the duel were pretty well known for. Holly made a comeback, Charlie Haas finally entered with loads of momentum, and he was going crazy. I mean, look at this stuff. I never seen Charlie Haas do this stuff personally. This is more down Shelton Benjamin's alley in my eyes. The crowd really wanted to see the good guys as champs. Molina's presence was definitely felt for good and for bad. The ref was getting distracted. Eminem played dirty, hit the snapshot, and they retained the titles. Now, honestly, that dive Haas performed, it caught me completely off guard. It's like if Rey Mysterio hit power moves, I guess, something like that. A rematch was made for that week's SmackDown, it was once again for the titles. During the match, Hardcore Holly grew frustrated with Eminem's actions. They utilized the tactic of isolating one teammate, you know, the heel special, and once Hardcore entered, same story, different person. This time though, Hardcore inadvertently knocked down the ref. He hit the Alabama Slam, one, two, three, four, five, no ref. So Johnny brings in a chair, whacks Holly right in the head, but the ref notices, and they get disqualified. Charlie had a rare moment of intensity, and since Haas and Holly never lost, they got a rematch the following week. This time, though, it was a 15-minute Iron Man match. Now, I think out of all the Iron Man matches WWE booked, this has to be the most obscure one. I completely forget about it. I don't even know if I even knew about it before this video. There was a 15 minute time limit. Eminem used some cheap interference to get the first fall. After the commercial break, it was 2-0. Despite being in a disadvantage, Charlie Haas quickly bounced back by catching Mercury off guard with a crucifix. The champs continued to isolate Haas on their side of the ring. They taunted Hardcore and he tried playing mascot, getting Charlie back into it. It took him a few seconds, but he found an opening and tagged in Hardcore Holly. He was finally in. Hardcore was going all out. Molina was screaming. The crowd was excited, but Eminem slowed things down. With 20 seconds left, they almost screamed screwed up as Holly hit the Alabama slam. Melina runs in and covers Joey, which would have made her champion if this was WCW of 2000. She wasted a few seconds and once Hardcore went for the cover, time expired. This met Eminem were the winners and this feud was over. And now it was time to move on. Melina, on the other hand, she finally got some action on her hands. On the June 16th episode of SmackDown, Heidenreich was reading a poem once again. The Divas came out, made a big deal out of his chocolate bar, not like this. Joey wanted to give him a kiss, you know, get it, kiss, hugs and kisses. And Eminem interrupted. Melina was disgusted by all this and said that everyone knows that Eminem is much sweeter. You don't get it? I don't even need to say it. Michelle chimed in and this led to an insult from Melina. Heidenreich got defensive and the two others were cracking jokes. Melina shouted she'll never be Heidenreich's friend. Hell, she even called him a kindergartner on crack and this led to a spear from Michelle. Eminem then attacked, not the woman as expected. They got a snapshot in and the following week during Mercury's match with Heidenreich, Michelle lashed out to Melina. This distracted the ref and in the ring Nitro had a super kick costing Heidenreich the match. To this day, I still don't know where she came from. She just emerged out of nowhere like the hurricane or something. And obviously, Melina had to whine about this. She challenged Michelle to a one-on-one -on -one match for the following week. Eminem gave her props, and as expected, a bunch of celebrities were gonna watch her debut match. And get this, 
Ashton couldn't make it because Anaheim sucks. With that said, the match was rough. Melina got what's coming to her. She was aggressive. The crowd was into it by the sounds of it. And Melina had to resort to cheating to win it, although it might have got her way regardless. After the match, Eminem hit the snapshot once again. Heiderreich then ran in there shouting, she's my friend, and the trio were all smiles. Before the story could escalate between Eminem and Heidenreich, the duo once again faced Eddie and Ray for the titles. It was the same story as last time where Eddie left his partner for dead. Meanwhile, Melina continued to stir the pot with any woman with a beating heart on SmackDown. This time, she ridiculed Tori Wilson, who made a challenge. Melina accepted and won the match for the Great American Bash. But, since Melina was hell-bent on exposing her, Tori challenged her to a bra and panties match for the pay-per-view. I guess it's about Melina getting embarrassed in the magazines or something like that. A couple of minutes later, Eminem attacked Heidenreich once again. They were relentless in their assault. Melina began shouting, you have no friends, when Road Warrior Animal returned. Eminem tried fighting him off, but were unsuccessful, and he basically ate them for lunch. Animal then grabbed a microphone and was like, fans have been telling me about this team that's been killing everybody, you know Eminem, and he called them a little baby punks, to which Mercury responded by challenging the Road Warriors to a tag team title match. Nitro chimed in and said that can't happen, because Hawk's dead. Man, that hurts more today than it did then, for sure. Definitely. Heidenreich pulled him away and convinced him to be his tag partner for the pay-per-view. So it was going to be Road Warrior Animal teaming up with Heidenreich to face Eminem for the titles at the bash. This was to promote the new LOD DVD that was just released and it was going to lead to a final run for Road Warrior Animal. Melina, on the other hand, continued to make an enemy of the SmackDown Divas. This time she provoked Candice Michelle, who was going to officiate the match at the pay-per-view. She attacked and beat the living hell out of her, stripped her of her clothes, and Tori finally made the save. At the bash, Mercury and Nitro bit a little more than they can chew. The team of Animal and Heidenreich proved to be a formidable duo, obviously. And as expected, Heidenreich wasn't going to be able to replace Hawk, but the crowd was still into the match. It wasn't good, but sometimes you gotta look at the bigger picture, I guess. Heidenreich found himself at the mercy of Eminem, and it was building up to that Animal hot tag. Heidenreich's leg was a pretty big liability, but once Animal entered the match, he had a burst of energy. Eminem almost won the match using one of their well-known schemes, but it wasn't their night. Heidenreich went up top, and they hit the Doomsday device to win the Tag Team Championships. Cool. I don't think this tag team was very well received, but the fans really loved it because Animal won another tag team title and he did it in honor of his best friend, Hawk. Like, it can't get any better than that. The crowd loudly chanted L-O-D and Animal was emotional. He let Hawk know that this was for him, but that wasn't it for Eminem that night. Melina complained about the title loss, but promised her boys will recapture the titles sooner rather than later. As for her match, let's just say she went in there with a John Cena of brown panties and actually won. Unfortunately for her, she was still stripped. Hell, even the referee herself stripped. Taz was trying to remind Michael to stop being an idiot, and those two celebrated. They went to Raw a month later, and who knows, I might even dive into their run eventually. On the July 28th, 2005 episode of SmackDown, Eminem wanted to quickly bounce back. Melina got them a publicist and promised the team the cover of next month's SmackDown magazine. They were gonna have a fixer on the road, and there she is. The crowd couldn't believe what they saw. Taz and Eminem were at a loss of words before Mercury asked... Would you? Over the next couple of weeks, Eminem didn't really do much of note. On the first Friday Night Smackdown episode, they challenged LOD 2005 for the Golden once again. Cheating was on the menu, but it didn't bring home the titles. That wasn't it. For some reason, despite outright losing, Eminem got another chance at Tag Team Gold the next week. It was like Teddy Long was spamming the match on GM mode and hoping for an Eminem victory. This time around, Eminem made the mistake of using the titles right in front of the ref, giving LOD the victory, then possibly giving Eminem another match because the only team left on SmackDown was the Mexicals. As for Jillian, she became JBL's publicist. Melina continued to cause problems with women. This time around, she messed with Christy Hemi, who in one week turned into a motorcycle enthusiast. Basically, Melina wanted to be the number one diva on SmackDown, and with Christy on the show, there was worry over whether or not she'd retain the spot. They actually had a wrestling match, then it turned into a fight. Melina needed external help to score the W once again, and after the match, she wanted some of the little diva, but then she almost found herself in snapshot position. LOD made the save, and you know what that means. Rematch. LOD took notice of their lack of a manager this time around, and got Christy Hemi. On the final SmackDown before No Mercy, Eminem interfered in LOD's tag team match and attacked. This time they successfully hit the snapshot, and the reason why they did this, while well, other than being douches, was to gain a slight advantage in the six-person tag at No Mercy. As for that match, Melina got what's coming to her. She got her ass beat by Christy, she got the Doomsday device, but the feud wasn't over. Rest assured though, it was coming to an end. 
On the October 28, 2005 episode of SmackDown, Eminem challenged the Mexicals, LOD, and the team of Paul Burchill and William Regal for the Tag Team Championships. During the match, once again, LOD had it won, but this time the Dicks interfered and attacked Road Warrior Animal. In the ring, Eminem took advantage, hitting the snapshot on Heidenreich to capture their second WWE Tag Team Championships. What this also meant was that Eminem was coming back home to Los Angeles as champions. Right when SmackDown began the following week, we see Eminem get a warm reception from the fans. They signed autographs, and it was a great homecoming, but Teddy Long crashed the party. He congratulated the team, but his way of congratulating the team was by booking them in a tag team title match against Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. Stupid idiot! Story of the match, Eddie struggles to get that tag, but TSO was chomping at the bit to just get in there and wreck Eminem, and once he was in there, he let out all that pent-up anger. Momentum was finally on Eddie and Batista's side, but Molina brought out some brass knuckles. Eddie was only seconds away from that W, but he decided to frog splash Molina instead. Mercury got a hold of the knucks, and he knocked out Eddie. This gave Eminem the victory. After evading Eddie and Batista, Eminem developed a feud with the Mexicals. On the November 11th episode of SmackDown, Molina selling the effects of last week, you know, frog splash, she came out and praised herself for being consistent, appearing on TV despite her bad back. And she called her boys the most amazing team in WWE history before insulting Tyra Banks' next top model show. I'm mentioning this, why? Well, just wait up. Melina introduced a woman from that show who I should know was on Tough Enough in 2011. How do I know this? I don't remember how I knew this, but whatever. Melina was rude to her after the commercial break, calling her a C-list celebrity. Michelle, the woman, slapped her, and Eminem were playing mascots when the Mexicals appeared. The trio whooped her ass and celebrated with Michelle. So the story of Eminem and the Mexicals was on. Meanwhile, Melina began eyeing championship gold. Since SmackDown vs. Raw was on, Melina took advantage and challenged for the WWE Women's Championship. On the final Raw before Survivor Series, Melina had T-Bar and Mace of Retribution abduct the WWE Women's Champion Trish Stratus. And honestly, when I was watching this, it got me laughing. Nobody in the arena even thought to help their brand's champion, let alone Trish Stratus. The duo were revealed to be Nitro and Mercury of Eminem, obviously. Melina called herself the most dominant diva in the WWE, and since she won the Battle Royal, during Eddie Guerrero's tribute show, she wants a title shot at Survivor Series. Trish, without hesitation, accepted, but Melina sent a message in the form of a kick. A couple of seconds later, Jerry Lawler went after her. Uh, the match at Survivor Series was pretty decent. It wasn't bad. For some reason, I watched this pay-per-view a bunch several years ago, so I'm kind of familiar with the action. Mercury and Nitro were out to help their girl capture the gold, while Mickey was playing mascot for her friend. Trish was resilient, she took a lot of punishment, Melina was once again aggressive, but near the end, the champ had a lot of momentum. She was hitting a bunch of moves, she almost hit the Stratisfaction, but it got blocked. She hit a chick kick, hit a bulldog, or an alternate version of the Stratisfaction to retain the title. Following Survivor Series, Eminem focused on their next tag team challengers. Was it going to be LOD, Scotty Tuhati, and Funaki, the dicks? Well, a battle royal was going to determine just that. Melina got the commentary team to stutter over their words by doing the splits on the announce table, and... They didn't know what to do, but then they realized something. They realized, well, it's okay to stare. They read the t-shirt. Anyways, the Battle Royale ended up with two teams. The Dicks, the Penises, and the Mexicals. Those guys got a little arrogant and ended up losing. Eminem had a great view of the action and began strategizing for Armageddon. Funny enough, before that match, Eminem ended up being Sacrificial Lamb. For some very abrupt reason, Eminem were forced to defend the gold against the team of Batista and Rey Mysterio two nights before Armageddon. While Batista was preparing for the match, Molina made an offer that Batista himself couldn't refuse. She offered herself for a bit, if Batista forfeits the match. And I guess he accepted. A while later, she's like, so we have a deal, right? Batista scoffs this, laughs it off, and says, <laughs> no deal, with a smile on his face. He thanked her for the warm-up as he's ready to kill those guys. And she was seething. This whole thing screwed up Eminem's game plan. And also, for all we know, Chris Benoit and Lundrick might have watched on inside a closet. It was like a guarantee that Batista and Ray were winning this one. There was a fog of smoke and Eddie Guerrero chants took over the entire arena throughout the match. There was blood, slaw chants, and Eminem did what they do best. Isolate. They isolated Rey Mysterio for a very long amount of time. He took all that punishment, got some inspiration from Eddie, and Batista was finally in. He was going crazy. The fans were shouting in excitement, and Eminem were wrecked. Loads and loads and loads of energy. Ray hit 619 on Nitro and Molina. Batista hit the Batista bomb on Mercury, and they were champions. I believe this was to promote the upcoming Armageddon match against Ross, Big Show, and Kane as champions versus champions, I guess. Regardless of how received this match is, it's one of my favorites from 2005. It's not up to par with the other matches in terms of, like, action, but the atmosphere and the moment itself, I just love it. They did it for Eddie, they hoisted the t-shirt in the end, amazing moment. 
Ray and Batista always remind me of some sort of sibling relationship. You know, Batista was defensive brother. Ray was a little one. That's what they always remind me of. But anyways, Melina was ready to strike back. So apparently she was gonna hold a press conference. Melina was accompanied by an attorney and she wasn't really in a very proud, happy mood. A tear from Melina said that this wasn't easy for her. The fans booed. They chanted Batista and she said that as a role model for young women, she has no choice but to summon the curse to do what's right. Not just for herself but for every other woman who has been in this position. She admitted that she was a victim of a sexual predator. The fans continued booing. Now obviously she was claiming Batista was responsible. She admitted that there was an incident of inflirtation but that turned into something very abhorrent. She told him to stop and he didn't. She struggled to muster up the curse to continue but she did. Melina claimed that Batista used his influence as world champion to force her into sexual relations. The fans continued chanting his name and support, and she continued claiming Batista isn't the man who he says he is. She claimed that he will stop at nothing to get what he wants, and she continued to be haunted by that smirk, and it will be an image that she will carry for the rest of her life. Once again, Batista chants intensified. The fans were in complete support of the animal. Melina wanted to ensure this doesn't happen to any other woman, and so she filed a lawsuit against one Dave Batista. She's suing him for sexual harassment. The fans insulted her, continued booing, and the commentary team were speechless. Later that night, Batista responded to these rumors stating that he ain't worried about it. All he's worried about is defending the titles against Eminem. As for how that match went, Eminem worked on Ray's leg, leaving him at a very big disadvantage. Once Batista entered, same story as last time. Intensity, ruthless aggression. And despite the leg, Ray was doing stuff like this. In the ring, the ref accidentally got knocked down, and it was then where freaking Mark Henry appeared. What the hell? It was definitely a shocker. He comes in, ambushes Batista, and hits the world's strongest slam, and Mercury takes advantage to recapture the titles. Henry was revealed to be an associate of Melina's, who's no longer teary died. She was joyful at this point. Mark Henry was essentially her bodyguard, I guess. She continued reiterating her story. Batista, on the other hand, still denied the accusations. He claimed he never sexually harassed anyone, and Melina never said no or stop. Henry barged in and he asked, what's the champ's malfunction? Like, what's wrong with you? He thought Batista was sick and living this fake, wholesome image. He then asked, what if it was he who's taking advantage of Batista? Batista didn't think this was a suitable place unless he, Mark, says so. Later that night, Eminem defended their titles inside a steel cage, and it was a rematch from last week. Now, the reason why it was inside a cage was because of Mark Henry. Problem is, this is Mark Henry we're talking about. He literally had to earn the name of World's Strongest Man. The funniest thing about this thing was the fact that it took Henry 8 minutes to break the cage chain. I think you can find some old SmackDown TV and videos that show us on the internet. And it doesn't make Henry dumb. Some people thought it did, but it doesn't. It's just awkward, and if anything, it's even more impressive that he broke it. Why? Well, the guys accidentally used a real chain that had no give on it. And Henry decided to take matters into his own hands and break the chain with his bare hands. He then broke the door off his hinges also and used it as a weapon against Batista to help Eminem retain their titles. Seriously, Henry in January of 06 was on top of the world. Batista had to surrender his title due to injuries sustained that week and it put a wrench into the whole program. As for Eminem, their little partnership with Mark Henry lasted throughout January of 2006 and following this, they had the tag team division in total lockdown. Mexicals, they failed to win the titles. Every time London and Kendrick stepped up in the non-title, they were unsuccessful. Even the greatest teams ever, Tatanka and Matt Hardy couldn't do it. Matt Hardy and Rogue Warrior Animal couldn't do it. And with all these W's, you'd think Eminem would be featured at WrestleMania 22, right? Wrong. For some reason, they were snubbed off the cart, and the backstage reaction to this was shock. They were, however, featured in the pre-show battle royal. They almost made it to the end, but the eventual winner, Viscera, eliminated them. So what's next? On the April 7, 2006 episode of SmackDown, Eminem faced Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Once again, I believe the expectation was Lundrick's losing. Because every single time they faced off on SmackDown or Velocity, Eminem always stood tall. This time around, it was the first SmackDown after WrestleMania, so anything can happen. Eminem relied on dirty tactics and experiences, and this usually gets them the win. They were gaining heat by the minute, but once London entered, it was explosive. The crowd really wanted those two guys to win. Despite Eminem's efforts, it wasn't their night. Also, that pinfall in my eyes, I thought it was a three. Eminem was breaking rules by the minute, but they didn't win. Out of nowhere, London rolled up Mercury to score the upset victory. Paul London and Brian Kendrick were just mainstays on Velocity at this point, but with the win, 
it catapulted them into number one contenders, basically. Over the next couple of weeks, Eminem lost three straight matches to the high-flying duo. Be it singles or six-man, they were always the losers. So a match was set for the May 5th episode of SmackDown. Eminem defend the titles against London and Kendrick. Before the match could even occur, Mercury and Nitro ambushed the team. It was clear that they weren't in the mood or in the proper attire to defend the titles, but later that week it was announced that they will at Judgment Day. They explained why they attacked the following week, and Mercury claimed that they don't like when people try to go and embarrass them. So that's why they delivered three snapshots to Lundrick. Melina thought the little guys wanted a few seconds of fame coming out and trying to embarrass the champs. All of a sudden, Jillian Hall interrupted, and I should note, Melina had a little issue with her at the makeup table, so that's why she came out. She was ready for a fight and Lundrick from out of nowhere emerged, returning the favor from last week. This time though, it was more about humiliation. It wasn't like they were out to kick their asses. They were out to just embarrass Eminem. Literally. Look at that. Now about the match at Judgment Day, Eminem completely lost. It was a fun bout. London and Kendrick had Eminem's number like nobody else. Before Lundrick, I believe they've never lost a 2-on-2 tag match since December of 2005, I guess. The challenger showed heart and dedication. Molina obviously influenced the course of the match. Champions went in and dissected Kendrick, while Paul was anxiously awaiting the tag. The crowd really wanted to see the babyfaces win, and upon entering the match, Paul was almost unstoppable. So unstoppable that Melina had to scream in the ref's ear to stop the count. There was a little scare when Nitro had illegal leverage, but London kicked out, and things got worse for Eminem when Mercury accidentally blasted Nitro. This gave way to a roll-up, and Lundrick were champions! The former champions couldn't believe this, and they had a miserable look on their faces. Melina blamed Mercury for the loss. She shouted, pointed the finger at him, and not only that, but she slapped him. Mercury was gonna do something about it, but then Nitro blasted him, and the team was imploding in front of everybody's eyes, and they were loving it. The ref got low blowed by Melina, and a bunch of officials had to come in and separate them. Melina shoved a ref and Teddy Long. Later on, she faced Jillian. She was in a bad mood, and initially Jillian stood no chance. She eventually got around Melina's offense and beat her, despite Melina's hand on the rope. As expected, she complained about this to the ref. Crystal wanted to interview her and told her, I know it's been a bad night for you. She took offense to these words and it turned into a cat fight. Funny enough, she got her ass beat once again. Later on, Melina and Nitro aired their grievances to Teddy Long, who refused to do anything about it, and Melina, being an idiot, slapped the SmackDown GM who responded by firing her. Nitro shot it at him and he was fired also. They start the night off as tag champions lose the gold. Eminem dissolves, then they get fired. Now why did this happen? Why? Why were Eminem all of a sudden single stars? Because Joey Mercury was sent to rehab. He had his personal demons at the time and needed to get his issues in check before returning to the rink. As for Nitro and Melina, they were moved to Raw due to Melina's erratic behavior backstage. That's what everyone says. Rumor has it she got every woman in the locker room angry and I even heard some males were pissed off at her. Joey Mercury in the back was distancing himself away from Eminem while Nitro was receiving the heat that Melina had for being associated with her. Melina's heat might have even played a part in Eminem's split. Apparently, she fought Charmel after the whole Batista Booker T ordeal. She was sentenced to wrestler's court where she was summoned by The Undertaker, and I believe that's why they were moved to Raw. Nitro and Melina made their Raw debut on the May 29, 2006 episode of Raw, and Johnny Nitro found immediate success capturing the Intercontinental Championship. Will I cover his title reign or reigns? Hell yeah! Eventually. Now, as you may know, in late 2006, Eminem reunited. Here we go. On the November 27, 2006 episode of Raw, the Hardy Boys challenged any team to come down to December to this member and face them. We all know that the Voodoo Keen Mafia accepted, but since WWE wasn't gonna allow that, Johnny Nitro accepted the challenge. Out of nowhere, Joey Mercury emerged, and this was his first appearance in six months. Molina called it a one-night reunion. So Eminem's back, they were gonna help with the buy rate of uh, December to this member. Not only that, they were gonna have an awesome match, with the Hardys. The next night on ECW, the newly reformed duo sent a little message to Team Extreme. Now about their match at the pay-per-view, awesome! It blows any other match out of the water. The team has really put in work, and if you got a chance to watch it, you might enjoy it. Obviously, the pay-per-view takes a turn elsewhere, but in those first 30 minutes, it seemed like it was going to be a bright night. The Hardys ended up winning the match. Funny enough, after the match concluded, about a quarter of the pay-per-view's length of time had elapsed. Following the event, Eminem's little reunion took a turn for the very 
And I mean very worse. As you all know, Eminem were one of two surprise teams in the tag team ladder match at Armageddon for the WWE Tag Team Championships. While the match was very, and I mean very tremendous, there was one moment that overshadows any other in the match. So Eminem was looking to superplex Jeff Hardy, right? Well, Matt Hardy comes in and prevents them from doing so. He gives him a little headbutt and waits for Jeff Hardy, who jumps onto that stacked ladder, which rebounds off Joey Mercury's face and loads and loads of blood come pouring from his nose and possibly even his eye. Mercury's face was all swelled up and he had to immediately be taken to a hospital. Damn. You know that moment I've watched it a million times. I had the Armageddon in 2006 DVD as a kid, but damn. It's just too much. The amount of blood he lost, I think this is more brutal than any other blade job from that era of WWE. Like, the fact that his nose was all swelled up, good god. His left eye was closed shut. In an interview with WWE.com in December of 2006, Joey Mercury discussed the injury. And I quote, I've shattered my nose around the bridge area, said a bruised and swollen Mercury, who was severely injured at last night's Armageddon pay-per-view in a ladder match. I have four fractures on the inside of my nose. I have five stitches on the inside of my nose and my cheek, and 15 stitches on the outside of my nose and cheek. My left eye is swollen shut, and I have continual internal bleeding from my nose and from my eye. And when he was asked to compare the pain he felt in that moment to any other, he said this. I have nothing to compare it to. I've never been hit that hard in the face before. He said as he paused, I'd have to say it felt like a 100-pound steel ladder connecting with my face at 100 miles per hour or going head first through a windshield of a car without a seat belt on maybe getting hit in the face with a baseball bat swung by sammy sosa on that week's smackdown joey mercury despite the injury appeared he seemed like a completely broken man mentally and physically he thought he lost his eye in the moment and man it was just unpleasant everyone was at a loss of words for what happened to him he showed footage from Armageddon and the fans were once again speechless they did however applaud him for his efforts he held two people responsible for what happened those two people were Matt and Jeff Hardy. He placed the blame on them for all 33 stitches. He said that his movie star good looks might be gone forever and this led to Matt Hardy coming out. He said that nobody wanted this to happen. Joey, he wasn't intentionally injured. It could have happened to anybody else and that's the price you pay to compete in a match like this. Matt just didn't want himself or his brother to be held responsible. Mercury thought otherwise. Hell, he even asked Matt to fight him. But he wasn't willing to fight. He flat out refused to meet Joey's demand. So Joey instead asked him to fight Johnny Nitro. He ended up cheating to win and this put a small smile on Joey Mercury's disfigured face. Soon afterwards, he would wear a protective face mask. He wanted Matt Hardy's face to look like his, and that's what his goal was throughout January 2007. In his first match back, he faced Matt Hardy, and despite losing, Mercury stood tall, as after the match, Eminem exposed the concrete floor and hit the snapshot on Matt Hardy. Soon afterwards, the match was made for the Royal Rumble. Matt and Jeff, Team Extreme against Eminem. Once again, the match was pretty enjoyable. Matt's jaw was worked on, which put a smile on Eminem's face. Once again, they just couldn't get over the Hardys. And so their rivalry was going to continue heading into No Way Out. Now, initially, there was going to be a fatal four-way ladder rematch at the event. For a minor reason, which I'll get to soon, although it might not be the reason, it was scrapped. And Eminem ended up teaming up with MVP to face Team Extreme and Chris Benoit. Now, the reason why the ladder match was possibly canceled was because WWE wanted Eminem and the Hardys to be their own men. This is what I found from an old dirt sheet post back in 2007, but it doesn't explain the pay-per-view match. By the way, uh, Team Extreme beat Eminem once again. In the next couple of weeks, Eminem had their final matches against John Cena and Shawn Michaels and Lundrick. Their final match was for the WWE Tag Team Championships. They lost, and this was more about the ongoing Ashley and Molina story, who I should know won the WWE Women's Championship earlier that week. On March 26, 2007, Joey Mercury was abruptly released from WWE. He was pulled aside by Vince McMahon, and here's what he had to say, and I quote, I was lying to them because I wanted to get back from rehab so soon. I didn't want to tell anyone that I had a problem with painkillers. I didn't want it to look bad on me because at the time, I was on almost every Raw and SmackDown, getting a lot of work and being in a lot of good spots. Then one day before taping, I took some pills that somebody handed me. They weren't even prescribed to me, and I knew it was very wrong, but I took them anyway because that's the nature of the beast. Vince sat me down and said, We're not concerned about your work because we know you can pull it together for 30 minutes every night. We're worried that you're gonna die. WWE gave me every opportunity to get better, and I'm the one who f***ed up. I was one of the guys that you'd prop up after a match, put on a plane, and just get to the next town. Once my music came on, I was fine. I was gonna die. I've overdosed three times, and I've wrecked ten cars. I'm fortunate to be above ground, but now I'm at the top of my game, and I want to be the comeback of the year. Mercury did end up coming back. He cleaned himself up and returned to the WWE in 2010. Before cleaning himself up, however, Joey Mercury's house was on foreclosure. CM Punk got news of this and wrote a check, which is a tremendous gesture. And that's the story of Eminem. They reunited once more in 2017 
for one match, I believe, one match only. So, yeah. Overall, the trio were one of the very best tag teams of the 2000s. I think they would have been the very best had they remained. Because there was a lot left in the tank for sure. It's weird to think that if Mercury had remained, there would have been no Miz. And he probably wouldn't have been a star. It's just weird to think about. So yeah, that's the story of Eminem. I really loved it. And I thought I did a good job with it, personally. Their in-ring work was great. I really loved them inside and outside the ring. Their gimmick. I believe they were, in general, ahead of their time. Like, they should have debuted a couple of years later. I think they would have gone down better. What would you guys think of Eminem? Please comment down below. And that's it for this video. Make sure you hit Starship Pain on the like button. And perhaps the snapshot on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.